Leftists are upset because the Trump administration is planning to clarify Title IX, the law forbidding gender discrimination in federally funded universities. The administration wants to limit the definition of gender to male and female and would define males as the people who have penises and work the TV remote and women as the people who suddenly have babies after you were just innocently hanging out having sex with them. Before this, Democrats used Title IX to define men as rapists and women as the people who vote for Democrats, even though it makes no earthly sense. Leftist legal professor Perfidius von Mellenhead says the new change is unfair. In a major address to a lecture hall filled with dust motes and melancholy, the professor said, quote, if the Trump administration is allowed to define men as men and women as women, language will have lost its meaning, by which, of course, I mean it will lose the random meaning leftists assigned to it in the interest of winning political power. Why, before you know it, constitutional will mean according to the Constitution, as opposed to forcing people we disagree with to do what we want. Giving words their proper meaning is the first step on the road to Nazism, by which, of course, I mean liberty, as opposed to an oppressive, virulently anti-Semitic philosophy, by which, of course, I mean leftism, unquote. Transgender mixed martial artist Brunella Thuggish, formerly the male fighter Bruno Thug and currently the winner of the Women's Fighting Championship 17 consecutive times, told reporters, quote, This is a major blow to school athletics, by which, of course, I mean my ability to beat the living daylights out of women with half my muscle mass, unquote. Presidential spokeswoman Sarah Sanders denied the administration was trying to force words to mean what they actually mean. She told reporters, quote, I'm just saying that men are men and women are women, by which, of course, I mean shut the hell up and stop talking and saying crap. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Claven. This is The Andrew Claven Show. I feel hunky-dunky, life is tickety-boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky-dunky-dee-dee. Ship-shaped, ipsy-topsy, the world is a bitty zing. It's a wonderful day, hooray, hooray, it makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray. Oh, hooray, hooray. All right, we are back, and it is mailbag day, which means you are just moments away from all your problems being solved forever. Uh, I will answer your questions. My answers are guaranteed 100% correct. We'll change your life, possibly for the better. As you can tell, I'm not broadcasting from our studios. Uh, Austin forgot to pay the uh, electric bills and the electricity is down. I think it was, was, it was Austin, right? It's, it's got to be. got to be Austin. Yeah, of course. So uh, we, we've we gone dark. This is a professional operation, folks. But I'm broadcasting from my house. You can see it looks like I'm in an overturned ark in a biblical disaster movie. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, but I am the storm. I am, I am the storm. I am Claven Bear. I am the, the storm. Ever since I played that yesterday, the Trumpy Bear ad, I am the storm. I've been walking around thinking, I, it's, no, I am the storm. This is what we need. We need a, a Claven Bear merch shop, you know, like a Claven Bear, his, his trademark lack of hair, put him in his favorite chair, and uh, you can have your Claven Bear. <laughs> You know, this is only one of the things, one of the wonderful things I want for Christmas, if you want my Christmas list. The other is this Lego block set. It's, it's an imitation Lego. I, I don't want to say it's Lego. It's an imitation of Lego that uh, is a that they've been advertising on Fox and Friends. Do we have just a little bit, a snippet of this? Take a look at this. A conservative company, Keep and Bear, introducing a new line of toys, encouraging kids to build the wall with MAGA building blocks. <laughs> The set comes with a President Trump figurine and a Make America Great Again hard hat. That's interesting. My favorite part of this is if you look really closely uh, in the background, the guy that you're keeping out is a little Lego style figure with a sombrero. <laughs> so they're teaching kids, teaching kids to go after those Mexicans early. <laughs> I, I don't know. I just I, I think it's hilarious. I think this stuff is hilarious. This is my favorite part of the Trump administration is the, the finally we're making jokes again. Uh, meanwhile, by the way, if you want to get a good night's sleep or like me, you want to lie awake in comfort, you got to go to Helix Sleep. There's no sense lying on a bed that was not made specifically for you. Helix Sleep built a sleep quiz that takes two minutes to complete. They use the answers to match your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress. Whether you're a side sleeper, hot sleeper, like a plush or firm bed with Helix, there's no more guessing or confusion. Just go to helixsleep.com slash Clavin 
even and take their two minute sleep quiz and they will match you to a mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. And for couples, uh, Helix can even split the mattress down the middle, providing individual support needs and feel preferences for each side. If you want to sleep well or like me, lie awake in comfort, right now Helix is offering up to 125 bucks off all mattress orders. Get up to $125 off at helixsleep.com slash Clavin. That's helixsleep.com slash Clavin for $125 off your mattress orders helixsleep.com slash Clavin. I have the pillow. It is an incredibly uh, comfortable pillow. And I lie awake asking myself the big questions, asking myself the big questions like, how do you spell Clavin? It's K-L-A-V-A-N. No E's in Clavin. I just make it look this easy. You know, I, I have to tell you, as I watch the news unfold, as I watch our culture unfold, more importantly, everything the left does, tries to do, says they're going to do, causes the opposite effect of what they think they're going to do. They call for diversity and they end up with segregation. They call for strong feminist win women and women wind up, the feminist women wind up, these quivering little, uh, these quivering little weaklings complaining about every little thing. And they say, oh, women should be appreciated for their minds and they wear up wind up wearing vagina hats where their brains are supposed to be. And of course, they call for equality and they go for socialism, which creates this powerful elite and puts everybody else in poverty. Is not, nothing is more divisive and unequal than socialism. And the reason, the reason for this is, in their care for the underdog, which I support, I believe in looking out for the underdog, but in their care for the underdog, instead of trying to lift up the underdog, they're always trying to pull down the stronger person. And that is a recipe for disaster, right? So if, thing, they, if things are tilted toward whites, instead of saying, oh, we're going to lift up blacks, what they say is we're going to tear down whites. We're going to bar the whites from this and we're going to tell them they can't do this. We're going to cut down on the number of whites. What do you do? You just reinstitutionalize racism and eventually whites are going to say, oh, well, if racism is OK, I'm in. I'll be in favor of whites then. And if men are strong and they feel that women are not as strong, they browbeat men into weakness instead of teaching women to be women and have strength as women. They browbeat men into weakness. And what's the result? Does that make men and women more equal? No, it means that only bad people, only men who can't be browbeaten are strong and women are abused even more, as we've been seeing in the Me Too movement, so much of which is concentrated in the left. And of course, the big one, if, guy, if there's a guy and he's rich, they say, I'm going to take his money away and give it to the poor instead of teaching the poor man how to make money, how to become uh, a richer guy and, and raise him up. They take money away from the rich guy. What happens then? The rich guy closes his business. The poor guy has nowhere to get a job. And so, you know, all of this, all of this is what it goes into the divided state of the country, the way this country is now. We're just not talking to each other. We're two countries completely at odds. And they think, they think, oh, well, you know, we've monopolized the academy. We won't let in conservatives to teach. They won't even let Ben in to talk half the time. They, they've monopolized the academy. They have completely monopolized the news media. The news media is absurd. And this is going to somehow force us all together, Hollywood, all the comedians, all of this stuff. This is somehow going to force us together to all become leftists. No, instead, it makes us hate one another. There's an exclusive poll out, poll out that the Washington Examiner uh, got an exclusive on. Paul Bedard was writing the article there. He says nearly three quarters of the country believes that the media is dividing Americans along political, racial, and gender lines. This is a stunning condemn condemnation of the press in a new national survey from Zogby Analytics Poll. It said that the media bias is sparking hate and misunderstanding. And while Americans also blame President Trump for dividing voters, the survey analysis said the media is worse. Those sur surveyed felt the mainstream media spreads hate and misunderstanding and also felt that President Trump is responsible for the spread of hate and misunderstanding. But more voters overall and in more subgroups blame the media slightly more. And you can see this. You can see this every day, especially as the way they are covering. I mean, it is absurd the way they are covering this recount in Florida and they hammer any Republican who says, oh, there's fraud. I mean, there's obviously in Broward County, there's obviously incompetence, at least, at least incompetence. And, you know, they're, they're reporting, they're reporting that the woman, this, uh, what's her name, Brenda Skypes or Brenda Sykes, I can't remember what her name is. They're reporting that she is actually uh, not, you know, she can't, she couldn't possibly be uh, unfair to, um, to, Republicans. She is a Republican. Here's Andrea Mitchell reporting this. This is cut seven. 
And we should also point out that Brenda Snipes in Broward County is a Republican appointed by former governor, then Governor Jeb Bush. So she was put in by a Republican governor after the mess that oh, we all remember from two, 2000. And she's hardly a Democratic uh, f official or someone doing the bidding of the Democratic candidates there. Hank, fake news. It's fake news. She's a Democrat. She's a Democrat partisan, clearly a partisan. Jeb Bush himself, who appointed her after the, you know, mess up on the uh, Bush-Gore campaign when they had to do th that recount, he appointed her to say, oh, we're going to be all bipartisan here. Even he has called for her firing. She has messed up so badly. So anytime Trump says, oh, there's, there's a problem here, they say, well, he's speaking without proof. But when the other side says something, when the Democrats say something, Andrew Gillum, for instance, well, let's play what Andrew Gillum said about this election. He's the guy who lost the governor's race. And so the task at our hand right now is to make sure that we show up and we show out in this process and let these folks know that we are not going to be ignored. We're not going to be hushed. We're not going to be set to the side. We're not going to be told that we don't have a seat at the table. We're going to pull up our own folding chair if we got to. We'll bring our own table if we must. But we're going to do our job to make sure that this process works for all of us. Unbelievable. So he's so when we say there might be fraud, there's no proof. It's conspiracy theory. We're undermining America's faith in our democratic institutions. But when he says it, suddenly it's a civil rights campaign. It's because he's being hushed. Who's hushing him? Where's the evidence that anybody's hushing him? If he's being hushed, how come we're hearing him from him? It's utterly ridiculous. And this is what divides us. This is what causes people to have conspiracy theories when they can't trust the information they're getting. Hey, by the way, let's pause here and remember that this is your last week to get the GenuCell Sunspot Corrector for free for sunspots, age spots, and even red and flame patches. This could be yours for free with the purchase of GenuCell. The brand new GenuCell Sunspot Corrector boasts outstanding reviews. It really does a wonderful job in making those sunspots uh, fade away a little bit. It's the last week you can get this Sunspot Miracle for free. Time is running out to take advantage of this offer. Watch your sunspots vanish and your bags and puffiness gone. New stuff on this, the bags under your eyes sucks out the moisture and makes them go away. As and for results in as little as 12 hours, the GenuCell Immediate Effects is also yours free. Here's how you get it. Text EYES1, E-Y-E-S-1, e -Y -E -S -1, to 77453 to get the GenuCell Sunspot Corrector free with your order. Don't miss out on this incredible offer. Order now, and as a bonus, receive Chamonix Luxury Microdermabrasion, also free. Rejuvenate and unclog pores for instantly radiant baby soft skin. Just text, text EYES1. E-Y-E-S-1 to 77453, and you'll get the GenuCell Sunspot Corrector free with your order. This, of course, is not, it's not just the news media. It is also social media. And here is a story that is unbelievable, but it tells you this is how the, the left, everything they, does, they do turns out the opposite. They think they're going to silence hate speech, but they just spread the hate by demonizing the other side. There's this guy, Palmer Lucky. He's the guy who found, founded Oculus. Those are those things you wear that give you three-dimensional games and all this stuff. And Oculus was acquired by Facebook in 2014. And last year, Facebook fired Palmer Lucky, and they say it had nothing to do with the $10,000 donation he made to a pro-Trump group. But Mark Zucker Zuckerberg, obviously the CEO of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, hatched a plan that was supposed to rehabilitate him because he needed to be rehabilitated for the evil of voting for Trump. So he told Lucky, what you got to do is you got to say you're a libertarian because you can get away with being a libertarian in, in uh, Silicon Valley, not a conservative, but a libertarian you can get away with. So he said, you go out and say you're voting for Gary. The problem was, the problem was that Mr. Lucky read The Art of the Deal by Donald Trump when he was 13, and that's why he became an entrepreneur. So ultimately, they couldn't rehabilitate the guy, and they fire him. They fire him. And this, of course, you know, comes on the heels of, uh, of Google firing James Damore for saying men and women are different, and that may have, be the reason they have different... Uh, you know, they show up for tech jobs in a different way and there are fewer women in tech. Facebook, see, here's the thing. Facebook is having a bad year. And it, according to the Wall Street Journal, it's taking a toll on employee morale with several key measures of internal sentiment taking a sharp turn 
for the worse over the past year. The stock price is plunging. Uh, there's leadership turmoil, critical media coverage, and just over half of employees said they were optimistic about Facebook's future. Now, this is like, this is amazing because the whole thing about Silicon Valley is you're supposed to feel that your company is changing the world. It's not just a communication tool. It's actually going to change the entire world. So now Facebook is thinking, are we the baddies? Are we the bad guys? You know, maybe so, maybe so. When you silence people, when you silence people, and call them call it hate speech and dis decree that anything that disagrees with you is hate speech you don't end hate you spread hate it's always the opposite of what they expect you know cat timp I, I, this story really got me because we all know these people are getting harassed and attacked anybody who's a conservative is getting harassed and attacked in restaurants and things but cat timp if you've ever met her she's just this tiny little thing and she's a kind of a cute funny presence on the greg gutfeld show and she walks into a bar and she told this story about what happened to her yeah over the weekend i was at a bar and a girl started she realized i worked at fox news started screaming at me telling me to get out i tried to move to a different area of the bar she kept screaming at me telling me to get out I kept trying to say like what did you, what did I say that you had a problem with? Or maybe I thought it was one of my views that was so offensive. She said it doesn't matter. I don't think she knew a single thing that I ever said on TV. She just knew where I worked. And that was enough for me to be run out of the bar. Because if you're Fox News, I mean, who has demonized Fox News? Who has gone out of their way to make Fox News just a byword for something is wrong? They don't even have to argue with it if it's on Fox News. They just roll their eyes and say, oh, well... It's Fox News. It's Fox News. I mean, that's how they, one of the ways they have silenced conservative voices is just by demonizing anybody who dares to take that tack. So now you get this girl going in. I mean, she's, she weighs, you know, she's five foot nothing. You get this girl going into a bar. She's being chased out of bars. And what kind of mindset, how, how toxic does your mind have to be before you do that? So by silencing hate speech, they're in fact spreading hate. And this is the thing. It's always the opposite of what they want. And, you know, Google's got a problem because now these guys are in their uh, face. They've got these uh, politicized workers who are trying to work their way up. Uh, Holman Jenkins writes about in this, the Wall Street Journal. He says, Google protests within the organization have been led by a group calling itself the Tech Workers Coalition, whose avowed purposes are ideological rather than strictly work-related. They want politics to be in control of business. That includes deciding which products and services will be developed. And the goal is power. A particular and immediate menace to Google's top leadership is a sexual neo-Puritaner Puritanism in the workplace that appears to be adopted mainly as a broom to sweep middle-aged white men out of the company. In other words, if you're a middle-aged white man, you are going to be charged with sexual malpractice and sexual malfeasance, and you're swept out of the country, the company. And the minute you're gone, the minute the white men are gone, that that charge is not, that that charge is not going to happen. This is the way. This is what happens. You know, it's like you think you think you're going to bring everybody together by silencing the opposition, but in fact, you just make the opposition worse, and in fact, you start to eat each other. Same thing applies to sex. And this is like if you see this is in the Atlantic. There is a, I think it's the cover article on the Atlantic that people have stopped having sex, and this is I mean, there's a sex drought going on, a sex recession, and and this is this is an amazing thing, right? Because if, if you remember the times that I grew up in, suddenly we were going to have sexual paradise. All the rules were gone. All we were going to do is have sex. We weren't even going to have to think. We weren't even going to have to have relationships. We're just going to hook up. And now they, we have the technologies to hook up. And everything is, nothing is wrong. It doesn't matter what kind of sex you have. You declare you're a man, you're a man. You declare you're a woman, you're a woman. Whatever you want to do, it's all fine. You would think people would be having sex until they couldn't think straight. Instead, it stops. And she writes in The New Yorker, this is Kate Julian, she writes, many experts attribute the sex decline to a decline in couplehood among young people. Why? Because when people are couples, they have sex more. Married people have sex more than unmarried people. She says, for a quarter century, fewer people have been marrying and those who do have been marrying later. And at first, many observers figured the decline in marriage would be matched by an increase in just cohabitating, but, they, but it wasn't. There wasn't enough to do it. People have stopped having relationships. She says, over the course of many conversations with sex researchers, psychologists, economists, sociologists, therapists, sex educators, and young adults, I heard many other theories about what I have come to think of as the sex recession. Now, listen carefully and see if you can hear the missing word here. See if you can hear the missing word. Here's why people, experts told her 
they weren't having sex. I was told it might be a consequence of the hookup culture, of crushing economic pressures, of surging anxiety rates, of psychological frailty, of widespread antidepressant use, of streaming television, of environmental estrogens leaked by plastics, of dropping testosterone levels, of digital porn, of the vibrator's golden age, of dating apps, of option paralysis, of helicopter parents, of careerism, of smartphones, of the new cycle of information overload generally, of sleep deprivation, of obesity. Think, what's the missing word? The missing word is feminism. The missing word is feminism. Feminism, which is a synonym for good on the left, good for women, cannot be to blame for anything. Couldn't be to blame for p- kids getting too fat because their moms aren't home to give them the love they need. Couldn't be to blame for that. Couldn't be to blame for the fact that people don't want to have sex. You know, <laughs> why do people have sex? You know, the thing is, that we've been sold this idea, especially about men, especially about men, that men are just a peg looking for a hole. You know, that's all a man is. A man, all, all we want is to have sex all the time. That's, you know, that's all, the only thing on a man's mind. I know the only thing on a man's mind. It's been going on for a long time, that attitude about men. Men want to have sex with women. And if women aren't women, what's the point? You know, having sex with women is a costly proposition. You know, they want you to stay around. They, you know, the old joke that you don't pay a prostitute to have sex with you, you pay her to leave. Well, you know, when you have sex with women, they want you to stay around. You want, they want you to help raise their children. They want you to help, you know, be, be a, an emotional support to them. Hey, it's great if you like women and if women are women. But if women are told uh, that they're supposed to hate men, if they're suppo- told they're not supposed to be women, that they're not supposed to be feminine, it starts to be a costly proposition. Everything they do, everything they do winds up the opposite of what it's supposed to do. So we were supposed to be sexually free. Feminine, feminism was supposed to make women strong. Instead, all they've done is drive us apart. All they do is drive us apart. And if you can drive men and women apart, you're really working overtime. You're really getting it done. I got to tell you, it is hard to pick the most insane story of the year in an insane political year like this one. But this has got to be close. This has got to be up there in the in the finals for the insane story. You want to talk about things accomplishing the opposite of what they're supposed to accomplish. You know the one, oh you know what before I get to this I hold hold on because I want to do I want to do one more ad and then get to this and not, so I can talk about it without you know this ad this is hilarious hilarious I'm always making jokes about how I never sleep and it's true I do not sleep a lot. So we have a new sponsor, Calming Comfort Weighted Blanket. And remember the blankie you had when you were a kid and it was supposed to make you feel secure? Well, that's what this is like. It is a weighted blanket and it's supposed to give you the feeling of security, of being hugged. It's supposed to bring down your anxiety level. Um, You know, you can, if you, it might help you sleep uh, faster as you, you know, when you have it on. So uh, of course I want to try this thing out and I want to I'm I'm getting ready to sell this thing and say make jokes about the fact that it felt good, but of course it felt good as I lay awake all night. So I put this thing on the bed and I turn to my wife and I say this thing is pretty comfortable, and that's the last thing I remember. I slept for me a huge six hours out like a light, <laughs> out like a light. So I tried it. I thought that can't be right. That can't be right. So I tried it again last night, and I didn't sleep that long because that would really be totally changing my life. But it really does work. I did sleep really well. It, it makes you feel calmer. It makes you feel uh, supported. And it makes you feel warmer, too, because it's getting a little uh, cold out here. The Calming Comfort Weighted Blanket comes with a 90-day anxiety-free, stress-free, best night sleep of your life guarantee from Sharper Image. And right now, just for our listeners, you can go to CalmingComfortBlanket.com, use promo code CLAVEN at checkout to receive 15% off the displayed price. Again, that's CalmingComfortBlanket.com, promo code Claven. And because you can't put a price on a great night's sleep, go online now at CalmingComfortBlanket.com and use promo code Claven for your special discount today. You'll be so comfortable, you won't even care how they spell Claven, but it's K-L-A-V-A-N, just in case you want to know. Have to tell you the story before we get to the mailbag. So unbelievable. This is written by Joy Pullman at The Federalist. A Florida school district allowed a self-described transgender female student regular at regular access to the boys' locker room with no advance warning to the boys or their parents. So this is a girl who thinks she's a boy, right? And they let her in the boys' locker room. And the first time she walked in, she caught the boys literally with their pants down and they were embarrassed, right? And they didn't like it. So the, the school put a gag order forbidding teachers from talking about the change and they... Or- 
ordered, they're making the world safer for people, right? This is what they're doing. They're making the world safer for transgender people. They ordered a male PE teacher to supervise the potentially undressed girl in the Chasco Middle School locker room, okay? And when the male PE teacher refused to knowingly place himself in a position to observe a minor female in the nude or otherwise in a state of address, administrators, administrators told him he will be transferred to another school as discipline for not doing your job in the locker room. So an adult male refuses to look at a minor girl getting undressed because she says she's a boy and he is being punished. And in an email, an administrator initially threatened to put the male coach on administrative leave, telling him that refusing to supervise a potentially naked female student would not be tolerated. Insane. Insane. It, I mean, truly, truly, it, it's insanity. And that's how they're, they left making people safe for their transgenderism is, is trying to to force an adult male to watch an underage girl undress. I mean, it's, it's insane. Everything they do turns out the opposite of what they say they intend, makes you wonder about their intentions. All right, we have the mailbag coming up, but we have to say goodbye to Facebook and YouTube. Come over to The Daily Wire and subscribe. Come over to dailywire.com and subscribe for a lousy 10 bucks a month or 100 bucks, even at home, I have my Leftist Tears tumbler always with me in case I have a sudden need to drink Leftist Tears. You can get this for a hundred buck subscription, which gets you a full year. What do you get? You get so much. You get to be in the mailbag. I answer all your questions. You get another kingdom. You get Knowles. You get Shapiro. You get me. It's great. You get our special shows when you can call in and uh, ask questions while we're on the air. All of that for a lousy 10 bucks a month or a hundred bucks a year. Come over to dailywire.com and subscribe. Leftist tears, they taste so good. Mailbag! <laughs> I heard it in the, in the distance. I heard that scream. From Nathan, dear Supreme... Oh, there it is! <laughs> Just pay the electric bill, would you? Just stop messing around back there. and pay the... From Nathan, dear Supreme Leader Clavin, Lord of the Multiverse, for the past three years, I have been seeing a girl in college. Our relationship would be on and off dating over those three years. We would be together, she would break up with me, and then I would convince her to take me back. This happened for two and a half to three years in college. Her parents recently divorced, and this opened her eyes to her father's mental abuse and lack of care towards her. She broke up with me a little before we both graduated college again, and I finally told myself I was done trying to bring her back, and I just wanted to move on. Then she came back to me and seems to have changed and has realized a lot of her deep-seated issues. She wants us to get back together and make things work. Uh, there are still feelings I have for her, but I know feelings are not always to be trusted. I always pray to God to open doors. He wants open, closed doors. He wants closed. Any advice would be helpful. Uh, should I, well, he's asking, should he move on or should he give her another chance? Well, look, on paper, on paper, there's nothing wrong with sitting down and having a cup of coffee with her. In real life, uh, from your letter, I, I think this is an unhealthy situation, okay? In real life, from your letter, I think this is an unhealthy situation. This woman breaks up with you, and you go crawling in the, on the earth to get her back for two and a half to three years. She repeatedly breaks up with you. Remember the song, the old Four Seasons song, No Woman's Worth Crawling on the Earth? Truer words were never spoke. You go back, you keep going, crawling back to her, and finally you say, you know what? That's enough. I'm not going to do it. And she comes to you. That speaks to me of an unhealthy relationship. That speaks to me of a kind of toxic pas de deux, where as long as you are willing to beg her to come back, she'll leave. And as long as you're willing to leave, she will beg you to come back. That's not what you want. You know, the whole secret to relationships is that women are people too. And the whole secret to women's relationships is that men are people too. You do not want to be in a relationship that is just some kind of echo of some neurotic problem one or the other of you have. You want to be be in a relationship with another human being that has an erotic romantic element to it because you're of opposite sexes. That's what you want. And that's not what this sounds like to me. I mean, to me, the other clue, by the way, is the fact that you wrote to me. If you knew this was the right thing, you wouldn't have written to me. You're, you knew somebody had to tell you that this is not a good thing, no matter what your feelings are. There are other women in the world. Uh, from Edwin, dear luminous cue ball of intensely luminous illumination. I love your cultural take on current affairs. It sets your podcast apart from Ben and Knowles. 
What is your argument when people like Sam Harris argue that if you'd been born in another country or era, then you would have followed a different faith than Christianity? Thank you for bringing this lapsed believer back around to considering God with your commentary. I have heard this argument. I don't even understand the argument. The argument, Steven Pinker makes this argument too, is how can you claim that your religion is true when there are other religions that also claim to be true? That's their question. Well, let me ask them this, okay? If you grew up in a different era or a different culture, you might have thought that lightning came from demons. Or if you grew up in another culture, you might think, for instance, that there's no such thing as evolution, but creation is true. What would you say to those people? How can you believe in evolution if some people believe that creationism is true? It's a stupid question. What it is, it is based on the liberal unwillingness to say that other people might be wrong. That's what it's based on. It's based on the idea when, when the Islamists started to attack people uh, in the West and, uh, or also in their own countries, people were afraid to say, this is a bad religion. This is not a good religion. I'm not talking about all Islam. I'm talking about radical Islamic, Islamism. That's what I'm talking about. People were afraid they'd start to say, well, it's religion is the problem. I mean, that's, what Sam, that's how Sam Harris started. He said, we have to stop tolerating this religion. They're bombing people. Well, they're not bombing people. It was one religion was bombing people because they were wrong. So if you grew up in a different era at a different time and you weren't a Christian, maybe you were wrong about God. Maybe you got it wrong. That's the answer. I, I don't understand. I don't even understand why that's an issue. Uh, of course, some, some, but look, if there's a God, and we know there is, if there's a God, he has a nature. If he has a nature, you can describe it insofar as human beings are possible, as far as it's reasonable for human beings to do it. If you can describe it, you can get it wrong. All right, from Bob, I'm a 20-year military veteran who happens to be black. What unites most veterans is our love of country and our ability to see all citizens as Americans. The left is pushing identity politics. <coughs> but the right hasn't been more vocal in countering their argument by proclaiming everyone Americans. Instead, conservatives acknowledge the racial argument, giving the argument legitimacy. Why aren't conservatives using this strategy? Bob, first of all, thank you for defending our freedoms and our country. You're absolutely right. And the answer is there. It's cowardice. I mean, they've been browbeaten into accepting this idea that we have to look at the world through race. If you take off the race-tinted glasses, your IQ will rise 10 to 20 points on the instant. If you look at people as just people, if you refuse to engage in conversations, the only time that race plays a part, when it does play a part, is when there are people who are racist. Then race plays a part. Racism is what brings people together as a race, right? It's when people say, I hate you as a black person, for instance, uh, therefore you can't use this bathroom. Now you're united as black people because you're the ones being oppressed. When that pressure is taken away, it's stupid to do what the left does to keep the pressure on by saying, well, it's the whites who are the problem. You got to stop. You got to stop. And what, here are the two problems that Republicans have, okay? We're talking about Republicans, not necessarily conservatives. To say to blacks, we don't care that you're black. We're just going to deal with problems as they come up and everybody equally. That is going to make a lot of black people who've been trained and conditioned to think, oh, our, my problem is because of my blackness. They're going to lose those people. They're not going to communicate. And the other is, is that the Democrats say, oh, we're going to do this for you, poor little black people. We're going to do that for you, poor little black people. And when uh, the other day, when Knowles and I were uh, at Loyola Marymount, somebody asked a question and unfortunately got lost in the kind of answer. Nobody answered them. He said, what, what, are, what do Republicans do for blacks? And the answer should be nothing. The Republicans should do nothing for blacks. They should do things for America. If you do things for America, that's Trump. That's basically Trump's ideology. What Trump says is everybody's going to have a job. That's all I can do for you. After that, if you're taking drugs, if you're having children out of wedlock, that's on you. I can't help you with that. That's that, the problem with that is they don't believe that's a good sale. They don't believe they can get votes by saying, we're not going to treat you like black people. We're just going to treat you like Americans. And we're not going to do anything for you that we don't do for everybody. That the, the left and the media, their, their warriors, their front line, have convinced Republicans that they cannot sell that. What I would like to see, what I would like to see is Republicans going into black neighborhoods and saying, hey, all we're going to do for you is what we do for America. We're going to get it right for America. And the only person who's done that is Donald Trump. The only person who's done it is Donald Trump. One of the reasons I think he polls well among black people. One of the reasons I think he makes the left, uh, the left panic. Bob, I, I just completely agree with you on this. I think we should take a, t a totally different tack, but it takes courage, not the first quality most politicians have. 
From Caleb, Dear Overlord Clavin, I've been dating a single mother for about a year now. I have really become attached to both of her children, but her oldest, who is four years old, is extremely fearful of everything, especially his mother leaving him. He goes into hysterics anytime she so much as leaves the room. I feel that this is because of his father's abandonment, and I'm not sure what to do. Is there a way I can instill bravery in the boy, or is it something you think he will grow out of? Thanks, your biggest fan, Caleb. Caleb, I got to tell you something. First things first, if you want to be a part of this boy's life, you got to marry mom. If you're not going to marry mom, don't become part of the boy's life. The last thing he needs is another guy swanning through, pretending to be dad for a year, and then taking off when things don't work out. You got to marry. You want to be part of this guy's life, this little guy's life. You want to do something for him. You got to marry this girl. You got to be there and be dad. Once you're dad, that's the first thing, because if you're not going to do that, you just shouldn't be part of his life, right? You know, it's one thing to go out and have a date with her somewhere where he can't see you. But once you're going to be part of his guy, this guy's life, you got to stay. You got to stay the way you stay as you get married. Once you're there, then you don't instill bravery in the boy. You simply teach him that he can trust you, that you're not going anywhere, that you're going to be there. You model courage for him. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to scold him. You don't have to wag your finger at him. You don't have to push him. You throw him out in the water to see if he sinks or floats. You don't have to do any of that stuff. Just take him with you on your, you know, whatever it is, guy thing that you do. Just make sure he's by your side and then he will learn. He, he'll learn to be like you if you're there, if he can trust you to be there. Do not get into this kid's life and then walk away because that's the worst thing you can do. Marry her. From David, dear Mr. Clavin, I'm a high school student in desperate need of your help. I often find myself engaged in confrontational interactions with people who make left-wing arguments or outlandish statements that are devoid of facts. I feel compelled to dismantle their arguments, and this often leads to personal attacks from both parties. This has gotten me in trouble at school, at home, and I recently harshly insulted a friend during the debate about Darwinism. I feel a need to prove everyone wrong, and I am constantly arguing with others, and everyone around me is beginning to despise me. What do I do? Well, you got a problem, pal, and the problem is not politics. The problem is you and your relationship with other people. Listen, Politics is not the most important thing in the world. Relationships with other people are far more important. Love is far more important. You're not treating people in a loving way. You're not listening to them. You're, you're so, you know, I remember when I first kind of switched over uh, to conservatism, I saw this new thing that I hadn't seen before and I couldn't unsee it and I wanted to share it with everybody. And I lost some friends and it was my fault. It wasn't that I was yelling at them, but I just couldn't shut up when they didn't want to talk about it. What, what I would do, I, I would do two things. One, I would stop. I would stop talking politics. If you can't stop talking politics, I'd get yourself some counseling because that's not a political problem. That's a psychological problem. You have a problem with rage. You have a problem with the way you re relate to other people. I would get some counseling for that because that's a problem. You got to stop. Then I would also find some like-minded people some like-minded people that you can express yourself with in a more friendly way, maybe join a Republican club, a political club, you know, hang out with people uh, or start a political club so you can hang out with people who agree with you and talk to them. Because the, this, this is a problem, but it's not a political problem. You should be able to talk to people about politics in a polite, respectful way. If they're not if they're not attacking you, if they're not obviously shouting and screaming at you, but you should not be arguing, you know, insulting your friends over Darwinism. It's absurd and it's a problem that you have. It's a psychological problem. So leave the politics out of it. It's kind of like alcohol. If you can't handle alcohol, don't drink. If you can't handle politics, don't talk about politics. If you want to talk about politics, find some people who are like you and talk to them about it. All right. From Julie, dear Andrew, I have been a listener to your show for quite a while, but too cheap to subscribe. That changed when you recommended the tel Terror Television series because I loved the book. Uh, as someone who loves to read, I'm always looking for my next book. What are some overlooked classics which you might recommend? Something along the lines of where you finished it and you thought to yourself, wow. Uh, th why is this not more well known? Uh, I enjoy a wide range from Dante to Dashiell Hammett, so anything goes. Thank you and God bless. Uh, you know, you could ask me this question every week and I would come up with a different answer. There are so many books that fit that bill. But the, the one that springs to mind that not enough people read, especially in America, but even in England, is uh, Trollope. If you've never read Anthony Trollope, he is the grown-up Dickens. He's also the conservative Dickens. Uh, nobody is as great a prose stylist as Dickens. Nobody could create the larger-than-life characters that Dickens created. But if you want an actual great, no if you want actual great novels about what it was actually like to live in Victorian England, 
Uh, Trollope is the guy. He is much, it's much more realistic, much more hard bitten, uh, also, but also filled with humor and life and love. And uh, his, the one I loved was the Barchester series. It begins with The Warden. This is one of his shorter books. Goes into Barchester Towers, probably his famous book. Then the the one that's I think it's the fifth one in the series. I think there are about five books in the series, and I'm talking from memory, but it's I think it's called The Small House at Allington. Uh, and it is one of the greatest novels ever written. It is a great novel. I do not recommend, oddly enough, that you just jump in and read that one. Uh, but it, it, because I, I think when you get to it after reading the rest of the series, it's so much more powerful. But it is just a brilliant, brilliant book. So Trollope, definitely try him. If you've already read him, uh, Of Human Bondage by Somerset Maugham. Nobody reads that anymore. Great, great novel. Uh, the one I'm always trying to get Shapiro to read is Raphael Sabatini wrote Great Adventure novel, Scaramouche and Captain Blood. A lot of his books were made into Errol Flynn films, so that gives you a sense of, uh, of what they are like. Um, all right, one more from just a name K. To the Grand Crusader, uh, Justicar Clavin, High Lord of the West Coast, leader of the dreaded tear drinkers, he of the multitudinous titles, the immortal vanquisher of Knowles, and greatest of the faithful servants of the Daily Wire, God King, I am writing today to thank you for the part your podcast has played in my life. When I graduated college in 2016, I was overweight and had nowhere to go. I took to listening to your podcast uh, and used it to regulate how long I was in the gym. Eventually, I ended up losing more than 40 pounds listening to your podcast in the gym uh, with, and also with a proper diet. And I took my newfound work ethic and applied it to becoming an officer in the United States Army. What a great story. I was accepted at the Army Officer Candidate School in late 2017 and graduated there for this past September. Uh, I'm waiting to further my training as an infantry officer. I do not have a question, but I hope you will get the chance to read this and hear my sincere gratitude for the show that you and your team make that truly improved my life for the better. Thank you, he from whose head the glory of God shines. That's a beautiful letter, pal. I really appreciate it. Uh, it, it means so much to me, and I'm glad... Uh, you thank the team, too. We couldn't do it without it. So, Austin, we forgive you for not paying the electric bill. You saved the guy's life. Uh, that, that's beautiful, beautiful. An infinite victory. Uh, I really appreciate you letting me know. I guess I got to stop there and move on to Tickety Boo News. I, I have to do this quickly because we're out of time, but I got to show you the best pundit ever. If you haven't seen this guy on the BBC, Shapiro and I are always talking about how silly it is that people make predictions in the, for the future. And we talk about the fact that the the smartest thing you can do as a pundit is to predict the some make some outlandish prediction of the future. Because if you're wrong, everyone will forget. And if you're right, everyone will think you're a genius. And people do this all the time. Some sportscasters, that's the, their entire career, is just predicting that the underdog will win. And when he finally wins, you know, he points to himself and who has what has two thumbs and got that right, me, you know. And this is true of the pollsters. When they're right, they're geniuses. And nobody remembers when they're wrong. And it's just a, an amazing thing to do. That's why this guy is my hero. Here is a pundit on the BBC being asked about Brexit and what's going to happen next. So, where are we in all of this Brexit process? You know what, people like me are paid, aren't we, to have insight and foresight and hindsight about these things and to be able to project where we're going to go. To be quite honest, looking at things right now, I haven't got the foggiest idea what is going to happen in the coming <laughs> weeks. Is the Prime Minister going to get a deal with the EU? Don't know. Is she going to be able to get it through the Commons? Don't know about that either. I think you might as well get Mr. Blobby back on to <laughs> offer his analysis, because frankly, I suspect his is now as good as mine. <laughs> Guys, my hero. That's the that's I, I only can I can only aspire to be a pundit of that much sagacity and wisdom. I don't know. Get Mr. Blobby. That says that's the answer. It's just brilliant. We should all say that every day because it's the only thing that's true. All right. Hopefully, uh, what do you think, guys? We're going to be back in studio tomorrow, back in our fake studio. Uh, if Austin pays the bill, we will, be, we will get there. And we, can't even, we can only get back to our fake studio and then cr eventually claw our way back to our real studio. But we will keep on trying. I'm Andrew Claven. This is The Andrew Claven Show. The Andrew Claven Show is produced by Robert Sterling. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Technical producer, Austin Stevens. Edited by Alex Zingaro. Audio is mixed by Mike Cormina.
Hair and Makeup is by Jesua Alvera, and their animations are by Cynthia Angulo and Jacob Jackson. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire Forward Publishing production, copyright Forward Publishing 2018.